Welcome to our webinar this afternoon relating to aerospace engineering. We've got today we've got a specialist with us. Our little expert is going to be Clint Lively, and he's going to tell you about his profession and who he works with and his title. So Clint, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, name's Clint Lively. I work for the Boeing company. Uh, we're a subcontractor to NASA. Uh, the job I do, I'm the, uh, the payload safety review panel representative for uh, space station cargo integration. Uh, basically, uh, any type of uh, uh, payload that are going to go up to the space station, that can be anything uh, primarily experiments uh, that different private organizations or government organizations or maybe academic organizations uh, want to send up to the space station to, uh, to conduct their science. Uh, that comes through the, the payload safety review panel at NASA, and uh, I'm the representative of that panel for integrating the, the payload into the space station. That uh, primarily involves uh, making sure that they get uh, all of the interfaces they need, whether that be power or cooling or uh, uh, waste removal or, or whatever uh, whatever type of thing they need from the space station to be able to conduct their science. Uh, that's uh, that's what I try to handle for them and make sure they do it in a, a safe way that won't hurt the crew or the vehicle. Can you tell us a little bit about your educational background and why you decided to do what you're doing? Sure. Um, I uh, always had a, a pretty good aptitude in uh, uh, math and the hard sciences. Uh, I had a, a maternal grandfather that was an engineer, and uh, he was also a pilot in World War II. I was always really fascinated by that. So uh, I wanted to I wanted to go into something similar. Uh, when I graduated, I went to Texas A&M University, uh, got a degree in uh, aerospace engineering. Uh, I actually uh, specialized in uh, more along the lines of airplanes and space. Uh, that's one of the interesting things. Did I lose you? I'm still here. You hear oh, me? Yeah, we can now. We lost you for a minute. Okay, I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, don't know where you where you lost well, me. Well, you were talking about <laughs> you were talking about your you graduated from A and M. And you've got an um, aerospace engineering, but you okay. said something about dealing more with aircraft than spacecraft. Okay, right. That was uh, that was my primary intent was to to deal with aircraft. Uh, when I graduated in uh, in '94, uh, I sent out all my resumes to all the uh, aircraft manufacturers and and didn't get a single uh, single bite. But uh, most of them also had their their fingers in the in in the space industry also, and I started getting replies back that, uh, you know, we're not looking for anybody to work on airplanes, but if I was interested in space, I could uh, I could possibly do something. So uh, Texas a and is just down the road from Houston where Johnson Space Center is, and uh, so I ended up at Johnson uh, working in space, uh, which, like I said, wasn't exactly what I had planned, but uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes those things work out. Did you take a lot of math and science courses? Because I know you were very Absolutely. smart and Absolutely. a very good student. Uh, yeah, to to get a, an aerospace engineering degree is almost completely math and science. Uh, you know, at at A and M at the time, you were allowed four uh, four classes that didn't come out of the the math, science, or or engineering schools. Uh, you know, and that was pretty much your your two American history classes and. Uh, two, two that you got to pick. Everything else pretty much had you uh, um, doing math or science. Uh, you know, you you hit the ground running your freshman year, taking calculus, and went from there. And I think I took uh, took about three years worth of physics and chemistry, and you know, besides, but even before getting into the more specialized engineering courses, it was a uh, uh, a great deal of, of math and science. You definitely want to have a, a good, firm background in that if, uh, if you have interest in going into aerospace, for sure. Clint, can you tell us what your first space mission was that you worked on? Wow, my first space mission I worked on. That would have been in 1994. 
I want to say it was sometime around STS 60, 68, maybe 70. Uh, the way the, um, you know, the way the space shuttle uh, missions were numbered was uh, STS, was Space Transportation System, and then a number. Uh, pre, Pre-Challenger, it was a, a number and a letter, and it was a it was this complicated system, so they knew when the year and the then the letter was the uh, the number of flights in that year. But they learned really fast that uh, sometimes things would slip, and missions that you had planned to go in order would would skip around in different orders. So they just went back to numbering them just in sequential order. Uh, even when that occurred, they ended up you know with numbers jumping around on each other. But uh, uh, but the first uh, the first mission I worked on, uh, I was uh, I was back you know backing up kind of a following around some more experienced engineers on uh, some very very simple hardware that was actually uh, it was actually uh, hardware that they during the space shuttle program they used to to send up hardware where they would have a uh, it was simple things that you could easily get around Earth, and they would make videos of what they were doing with it so that they could send those videos out to schools, and, uh, and people in the, in the schools could do the same experiment sitting in their classroom that the astronaut was doing on, on orbit, demonstrate the difference between, you know, what happens in gravity, what happens in zero gravity, and, and things like that. So the, the first space missions I was working on was flying things like uh, high bounce balls and binder clips and things like that on the space shuttle. So not the... <laughs> Not super exciting stuff, but it actually was kind of interesting to think to, to learn from a from the ground up, just where uh, even something that we think of as very simple on Earth could actually uh, be dangerous if you put it in a in a spacecraft. So, what have you been doing lately? Uh, let's see. Lately, it's been all about the space station. Um, as hopefully most of your most of your students know, the the space shuttle program came to an end a couple couple years ago. And uh, we, we completed the construction of the space station. Spent many, many years uh, building the, the space station. Now its uh, its construction is complete, and it's a it's a true orbiting laboratory. So we're sending up a lot of experiments, a lot of new hardware to uh, to investigate different uh, different things. Everything from uh, you know Earth observation type experiments, where we're looking down on the Earth, looking at uh, weather patterns or or observing observing things like uh, uh, natural disasters, whether it be hurricanes or, or big forest fires, things like that. We're looking at uh, uh, all kinds of really interesting uh, phenomenon that occurs in in zero gravity that doesn't occur on Earth. There's a lot of uh, material science, different kinds of crystals that. If you try to grow the crystal on Earth, it grows one way. If you try to grow it in zero gravity, it grows a completely different way because of uh, the effects of uh, gravity or sometimes thermal gradients and things like that change on the, the crystal growth. Uh, fly some animals, observe how animals handle uh, zero gravity over time. Um, so it's been a been a lot of uh, a lot of interesting science stuff. It's going really fast right now. I spend I spend usually. Uh, Four or five days a week, every week, uh, uh, in meetings with uh, some some really really smart people, uh, PhDs from all over the world that are, you know, really uh, really elbowing to get their places in line to get their science up on uh, up on orbit, be able to compare uh, the things they've worked on on Earth to uh, prove prove the things that they've hypothesized over their their careers as scientists. Clint, I had read where they're trying to grow skin grafts on the space lab because uh, they think they may grow better in zero gravity. Do you know anything about that, or is that true? I know that that is uh, that's one of the items that uh, they look. I don't think it's going at any any fast rate now. Uh, one of the big um, it's, it's managed uh, by NASA by a, a nonprofit. Basically, it's a nonprofit organization on Earth called National Labs. That's a um, it's not a government organization, but it's basically run like a government organization. Uh, one of their biggest uh, facilities that we have up on space station 
uh, we call uh, HRF or human research facility. And uh, it's doing a lot of medical, uh, medical science, um, looking into how various uh, microorganisms, bacteria, you know, all of these things, uh, how they react to different, uh, uh, somehow that you might treat a disease on Earth, if you treated it on orbit, does it do the same thing or does it get some advantage or can they, can they modify their vaccine uh, to make it more effective? Uh, there's a lot of really interesting, really interesting science uh, going on up on the, up there. Uh, that they've got some pretty pretty spectacular. It's a, it's a very modularized uh, facility with its uh, little heaters and coolers and centrifuges. And if you see it, uh, you ever see you ever go walk look on NASA TV or if there's something uh, you know on Discovery Channel or something where you're watching the astronauts in the space station. You see a lot of these walls that just like look like white doors, kind of basically mounted in these lockers. And the whole HRF—that's kind of what it looks like. It's just a white paneled wall on the on the station. But if you if you were to open it up and look behind it, you've got just rows of uh, basically uh, uh, little small experiments. And that's uh, that's one of the ones we talked about a couple years ago. Was uh, where they were growing artificial. Uh, artificial skin and actually artificial uh, other organs uh, that they were they were seeing how they would uh, how they would grow would they grow faster stronger you know what would be the impact of zero G on uh, on those things uh, unfortunately in my job uh, I, I see a lot of this uh, a lot of these experiments up to the point when they launch and then if they decide they want to fly them again I'll see them again uh, but I very seldom hear uh, what resulted in the in the science afterwards? Um, you know the the results of the experiment, whether it be the the return of the experiment or a a videotape or or a a data stream of information, whatever goes back to the scientist, they take that work and go continue their work. And uh, people in my position very seldom hear back uh, if they were successful or not, which is sometimes kind of frustrating. But uh, but we're usually too busy to worry about it too much. So describe your typical day or week. Day or week. Um, typical is a tough thing because uh, I, I seldom have typical. Uh, but for me, normally Monday is, is kind of a, uh, a preparation day. That's usually where I have to uh, communicate with a lot, of my, uh, a lot of my NASA management, NASA customers. Uh, they have a lot of sort of status meetings times to to discuss what's going on what's expected to be going on where there's any problems who needs help what they need help on so so monday tends to be a lot of uh kind of the check-in day uh then the rest of the week uh i'm normally in uh safety reviews uh which is the which is uh when we do meet with various uh payload organizations they come in they bring uh, sometimes they bring hardware to show. Sometimes we just talk, uh, you know, talk to PowerPoint presentations. But uh, they come in, they explain their explain their hardware. They explain where they think they have hazards that would be hazards to the crew or to the vehicle. Um, and we go over with them the requirements that we have and ha- where they meet the requirements, where they have problems with the requirements. Um, and hopefully by the end, we we certify them for flight and 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 get them moving along. So uh, most of what I do for for most of the week is uh, a lot of a lot of meetings, a lot of sitting in a big conference room talking to people. Uh, I do occasionally get to go out and, and go to other people's facilities and see where they are building things. Sometimes that's part of their process as they need to uh, have verification that things are, are being done properly. So sometimes I get to do that, get to do that, but uh, um but a lot of time sitting in a, sitting in a chair listening to really smart people talk. <laughs> well, I think you're pretty smart too. <laughs> well, let me ask you a question: Are there internships for what would you what would you say to some high school students that are 
pretty interested, don't know yet quite what they want to do, but might have an inkling for engineering and may even want to steer your way. Are there internships that they can do? Or do they do that in their undergraduate degree? I mean, the new thing is internships. So can you tell me, do you have any interns around that do that? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, we we tend to always have a, a few around, uh, different different organizations get them at different times. I know uh, at uh, at Boeing, uh, before the uh, before the end of the space shuttle program, when I was in a, a previous job there, um, I would take on an intern just about every time they were they were asking around if anybody wanted one. Uh, at Boeing, it was a it was a pretty good pretty good opportunity. Um, you know, we had, I had various levels of success. Uh, for me, I know some people want to, they, some, some organizations get an intern in and, uh, you know, the poor student gets to make coffee and, and copies all the time. Uh, it might look good on a resume, but I don't know that it's very productive to the, to the student. Uh, for me, I always wanted to, you know, treat the, treat the intern like they were a, a new engineer, just like I would treat a, a freshly graduated engineer that's coming to work. So, um, some of them did a great job, hit the ground running and, uh, you know, would come back every other or every third semester for, for two or three rounds. Uh, some of them really weren't, weren't ready. So I would say if, uh, if I was a student now, I would, uh, I would very much encourage them to, to sign up for the internships, you know, go to your, go to your college and find out what, uh, what relationships they have with what companies, what organizations and, uh, and definitely, uh, apply. Most of them are very competitive. Uh, there's usually more people wanting those internships, and there are internships available. So don't get discouraged if you don't get one the first time. Uh, keep coming back. Uh, like I said, they are competitive, so make sure your grades are good so that when you when you do stack up, stack up against the other students that you're competing with, you look good. Um, and then when you go do this internship, uh, treat it very seriously. Treat it like a job. Um, you know, normally... Uh, the interns get to do some really cool stuff because, uh, you know, they're trying to give them the opportunity to, to see the different things that are going on within whatever business they're, they're looking into. Uh, normally, when we had internships come down uh, to Boeing, we'd make sure they got to go out to, uh, to Kennedy Space Center, uh, sometimes to see a launch. Sometimes that wasn't available, but at least they got to go out and tour that facility. Uh, you know, they certainly had access to the Johnson Space Center facility. Sometimes they'd get to go... Uh, Go out to ATK, which is uh, where they built the solid rocket boosters. Um, I'll try to make sure I get you a, a, some pictures and some video of, of that facility. That's really neat. We used to go out there and uh, and test uh, the shuttle SRBs, which is a pretty impressive rocket. Clint, have you because ever normally been... when you go see a launch, you see a launch at, at KSC and it you know leaves the ground and it's gone. Uh, at a ATK, they bolt the big rockets to the side of a mountain and burn them up so you get to see the thing launching for a minute and a half which is pretty impressive um so, so yeah i would definitely say uh, apply for the internships and uh and then take it seriously take it like a job and uh and do your best work and uh it was not uncommon at boeing uh people who did a good job as interns when they did come at, come out of school graduate from college uh, for those managers to be be looking for them and, and had a job ready for them. Clint, have you ever been privileged enough to ride on the Vomit Comet? I have. And can you uh, tell it was, us about that? It's actually quite interesting. <laughs> it, it's fun, and it's, uh, it's really interesting down here because at JSC, uh, they have a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of things that the flight surgeons do uh, where they need ground. When they do experiments in space, they do what they call ground control, not not ground control like it's doing the, the flight control, but ground control uh, like in an experiment. They want someone on ground doing the same thing that someone on the, on the vehicle is doing so they can compare and contrast the differences. Um, so you can sign up with the flight surgeons to do these, these ground controls, and you sort of get points uh, for how many you do. And if you've helped them out to a, to a high enough level, uh, the flying on the vomit comet is a... Uh, a lot of people want to do it, so you end up having to do a lot of uh, a lot of less fun experiments to to finally get allowed to do that. Uh, if you ever if you ever end up working at JSC or get an internship at JSC, 
the first thing you do when you go signing up with the with the uh, flight surgeons is they want you to do these smell tests <laughs> because apparently on orbit the the sense of smell takes a takes a little bit different turn than it does on Earth. So um, anything new that they fly, they make people smell and tell them if it smell bad, does it smell good, is it strong, not so strong. You do enough smell tests, eventually they let you go fly the vomit comet. But I got to go up there. Uh, with a piece of hardware that was flying the, uh, the Microscience Glove Box, which is a, uh, a facility on ISS, um, and just, you know, see, test out some of the, the mechanisms on it, how they would work in zero-G. Uh, it's pretty exciting. Um, I, didn't, uh, I didn't decorate the walls of the Vomit Comet the way some people do. Um, that's how it gets its name. Uh, but it's... Uh, it's the best roller coaster you'd ever want to ride. How many missions have you done totally? Excuse me? How many, how many mi missions have I worked? H yeah, how many missions have you been a part of? Oh, wow. I, I, couldn't, even, I couldn't even tell you. Um, probably, probably 75, 80, maybe. Space shuttle missions um, on space station, they don't count them quite the same. Uh, they, they count them as uh, flight increments that they count between times because it's, since it's up there all the time, they don't, uh, they don't count them like missions. But, uh, you know, so I've got, I've got several years working on the, the space station and have dealt with launches, everything from shuttle launches to the space station to the unmanned vehicles, whether they be the the European ATV or the, the Japanese HTV or the, the most recent uh, commercial SpaceX flight, uh, the Russian Soyuz Progress. Uh, I've launched a few things on unmanned Delta rockets. So, yeah, I don't know, hundreds at this point, I would say, a lot. <laughs> and do you get a patch for each one of those that you work on? Uh, most... Most missions have some sort of insignia. Um, yeah, I've got uh, I've got boxes full of patches and stickers and, and pins and and cool stuff. Uh, some uh, yeah, uh, it's really really neat. Occasionally, though, not so much anymore. But used to on the space shuttle program, they used to occasionally be able to send up little small packs with uh, with patches uh, that they would actually fly on the mission and when the mission would come back you'd might have the opportunity if you'd worked on it a lot to get a uh, one that had actually flown in space so I got a few of those that are framed and on the wall that uh, that I'm really proud of but uh, yeah they, they uh, you know that astronaut crew always tends to to make up a, a patch for their flights and and uh, you know, that's one of the things you usually end up getting when uh, when a flight's done. So, have you worked on any of yep. the Have you worked on any of the missions to Mars? I have not dealt with any of the Mars work. Uh, almost all that goes on at Ames Research Center, which is uh, in California. Uh, that's a different uh, different director to NASA that I, I don't really deal with. Uh, you know, we get some we get some exchange of data, but uh, the the unmanned portion of NASA and the manned portion of NASA uh, are quite different. And uh, almost everything out of JSD is manned space flight. Uh, so the, the, couple, the couple of unmanned Delta vehicle missions I worked on uh, was actually uh, several years ago when I was actually working for the European Space Agency. So I haven't done much of that in a while. But I, so, yeah, I've never, never got to work on the Mars, Mars vehicles. Clint, we want to really thank you for taking time today to share with us and to provide students with the opportunity to hear what you do. And maybe it will impact those that are curious and have been interested in aerospace engineering. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Tracy, and she's going to wrap us up. 
um, for our students that are joining us today for the recording. I just want to let them know that um, they will see resource links. Um, anything that you provide us, Clint, you know, far as pictures or video or resources, we'll have those things posted separately from this recording so that students can access that and take a look at it at their own time. Uh, but we also know that sometimes students will listen to um, your discussion and your presentation and um, they might have some questions that come about and so we want to encourage students if you have a question send that to me as the technologist um, to tracy.clanton at ttu.edu and then what I'll do is I'll take those questions um, I'll forward those to you Clint and, and ask for you to uh, kind of help us as our expert to answer those and then I'll turn around and post those back to our web and send those out to our, our uh, math science club members so that we can share the information and, and answer any questions that might come about. But we really appreciate your time today, Clint. Thank you so much. Oh, no problem at all. Hope, uh, hope it was useful. Hope people get to uh, find something interesting in it and, uh, and, and run with it.